Welcome to Waitsburg Christian Church. I'm Pastor Matt. Um, I just want to give you an update. So, as some of you know, my wife and I have been um, self-quarantined. I got a test done last Saturday. And finally, I wrote them yesterday because I wasn't getting any response. And the results came back and they shouldn't be surprising to my wife. She knew this all along and, and to a lot of you, but it, it's abnormal. Um, they went further on to say that the test wasn't actually performed because there was something, some issue with the test. So um, we're almost done with this quarantine anyway. So some people have recommended that I go get retested. No, I'm, I'm okay with not going through that again. Uh, so we're just going to wait it out. But uh, also an update on this church. Um, we are going to be um, a little more cautious uh, during this time that we're in. Uh, with the cases rising not only in Walla, Walla County, but also in Waitsburg, that's where we live. Um, if you're watching from around the country, around the globe, uh, the cases are rising around us. So we're going to uh, honor our neighbor and keep it safe. And we're going to, for the time being, this is temporary, we're going to be in our home. Um, I'm hoping that next week I can get back in my office and I can preach from my office, but um, we're going to have church online uh, for just the uh, just for the foreseeable future. It's going to be temporary. I'm praying that we can get back in for some Christmas services, but we'll have to see how that goes. Um, but I'm excited to continue today, uh, to continue this Jesus with sermon series that we're in. This is Jesus' thoughts and words on the, the times that we're going in, going through right now. Excuse me. And uh, today is going to be Jesus with sin. Now, a, a lot has been made about this word and this reality and humanity. And we could go on and on and on and dig really deep into this word of sin. But it brings a lot of connotations, doesn't it? When uh, Rachel posted our, um, our message yesterday that said the topic is, topic is going to be Jesus with sin. Even reading that, I was like, ah, that, that seems harsh. Just the word sin seems harsh to me. And there's some people that could say, you know, it's about time, you know, let's really dig deep. Let's really expose sin. And other people are like, maybe I'm not going to watch this sermon because the, the, uh, the idea of sin, you know, it's a little harsh and it's, it, it doesn't make me feel good. But what does Jesus have to say on sin? Let's take out all the pastors, the, the, the sermons, the messages, just for a moment. What does Jesus say on sin? There, there's one story that I want to focus on, and it comes in John chapter 8. And it says, I've, I've preached on this many times, but I want to look at it in a light of this sermon series that we're in, of Jesus with. What does he say about sin? And it says, Jesus ate one. Jesus walked up the Mount of Olives near the city where he spent the night. Then at dawn, Jesus appeared in the temple courts again, and soon all the people gathered around to listen to his words. So he sat down and he taught them. Then in the middle of his teaching, the religious scholars and the Pharisees broke through the crowd and brought a woman who had been caught in the act of committing adultery and made her stand in the middle of everyone. Then they said to Jesus, Teacher, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. Doesn't Moses' law command us, doesn't the Torah command us to stone a woman to death like this? Tell us, what do you say we should do with her? They were only testing Jesus because they hoped to trap him with his own words and accuse him of breaking the laws of Moses. But Jesus didn't answer them. Instead, he simply bent down and wrote in the dust with his finger. Angry, they kept insisting that he answer their questions. So Jesus stood up and looked at them and said, Let's have the man who has never had a sinful desire, not just a sin, but a sinful desire, throw the first stone at her. And then he bent over and wrote some more words in the dust. Upon hearing that, her accusers slowly left the crowd one at a time, beginning with the oldest to the youngest, with a convicted conscience, until finally Jesus was left alone with a woman still standing there in front of him. So he stood back up to her and said, Dear woman, where are your accusers? Is there no one here to condemn you? Looking around, she replied, I see no one, Lord. Jesus said, Then I certainly don't condemn you either. 
go and from now on be free from a life of sin. I'm going to read that again. Go on and from now on be free from a life of sin. Jesus with sin. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you that we're able to meet no matter the circumstances, no matter where we are at, Lord. We're so grateful that your spirit can pierce any wall and get into any home, any car, any coffee shop, cafe, whatever it is, Lord. We're so grateful that you are there, that you have prepared a way for us. You knew that this was going to happen. And I'm just thankful that you gave us such an amazing opportunity to reach those that you, those that you love, your children. In your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Jesus on sin, Jesus with sin. Uh, we're, we're in a time of our, in our country where sin has been something that's been a topic on every platform, hasn't it? The, the news uh, around the neighborhood, social media, every news channel, every channel. You have lying, you have racism, you have adultery, you have lust. And then, and then it goes on to describe the implications or what the implications should be of these sins. There are sins. We can agree on this, that these are all sins that I just mentioned. But before we start, what constitutes a sin? A sin is a standard set by, not by man, not by governing heads or forefathers or historical or celebrities or any type of figures, but a standard set by the creator of heaven and earth. The one who spoke it all into existence, spoke out the stars, the planets, the moon, the sun, all of it. He has a standard. And we, when we miss that standard, it's called sin. Sin is to miss the standard or miss the mark set by God, not by us. And as much as I'd like to move or adjust that mark, and a lot of us would like to adjust it depending on how it benefits us, I, that would be nothing short of playing God. You know, the mark has been set by God that started in the Torah, that started in the Old Testament, where over 600 standards of law that no one could keep. Some of you know that uh, at the beginning of this year, I met with someone in jail that um, took somebody else's life. And his reasoning behind it, not just to me, but to the courts and to the police, was that God told him to do this. And so when I had the chance to be able to meet with him and pray for him uh, and pray with him and read scripture with him, um, I asked him point blank. I said, have you asked for forgiveness for this? And, and I made sure to tell him, you know, this doesn't come from God. This, this horrific act that you have done, I want you to know this, that it didn't come from God. And I asked, Do you, did you ask for forgiveness? And he said, well, I don't really need to. And I, I said, why? And he said, well, I, I've set a goal to keep uh, all the laws of Moses. And I asked him, I said, you mean you're keeping all the laws? He said, yes. I said, all, all 600 laws. And he said, no, 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 just the ones that I think are important. And I realized how, how much that emulates all of us, right? Just the sins that, that we rank or categorize as worse than others. This, the, the message of Jesus, the message in here is that he became sin. He lived here 33 years, 33 plus years, and he lived without sin. Yet he became our sin. He became our error, our wrong. And by simply believing in him and his once and for all sacrifice, we can be forgiven of all of our sins and we can reconnect with God. That chasm, that great chasm that was created with Adam and Eve, we, we can now reconnect with him. And over the course of, of centuries, 2,000 years since his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension, much has been made about the topic of sin. What, what is Jesus' take on sin? I had a conversation with my pastor this week, and we were talking about the preaching of sin and the focus of, uh, on sin. And we both agreed it's important, it's relevant. But we both uncovered something very important, and it, it led me to this sermon today is, when you focus on sin, when the sermon is on sin, it can be self-defeating. By focusing on sin and removing sin, we become passionate about sin. We oftentimes think more about ourselves in that moment. We become consumed with our performance, 
our, ourselves, self-centeredness, and the cycle persists, this obsession over our sin, we find little freedom from that. Now, in the moment, it may, it may help right there in the moment. And there's some people that have far greater willpower than me where they're like, I, I'm taking this in and, and I'm going to work on this and I'm going to do it. My wife has so much willpower that I wish I had. But by, by saying I'm going to work hard to overcome sin in my life, is that, is that what Jesus is talking about? You know, what would Jesus say about sin? If Jesus was was approached with the gross sin of racism, the gross sin of lust, the gross sin of lying, of gossip. What would he say? What would, what would be his statements? What would be his tone? What would be his approach? What would be his facial expressions, his countenance? And for those, I'm, I'm talking to those who, who claim the word Christian. I, 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 want, I want you to know that the, that term Christian was only used two to three times in the New Testament, but the word disciple or discipleship was used almost 300 times. It's the emphasis on the New Testament. It's not, it's not the word Christian that's the emphasis. It's to be Christ-like, to look and live and love like Jesus, to walk in his footsteps. But sin in itself, by obsessing over it, by focusing on it, we turn to obsessing over our own performance. And I want you to see that. We, we turn inward, our weaknesses, our shortcomings. So what would Jesus say? What would Jesus' take be on sin? If Jesus was preaching today, if he was giving this sermon, if he, if he was talking about sin, what would he say? Well, if only we had a book or a story that uh, was accurate about Jesus, and, and we do right here. We just read it. Where he's in the middle of a sermon, and he's sharing this. He's, he's in the middle. Picture this. I want you, I do this every week. Put yourself in this moment. You're in this open courtyard or this building with, with no windows and you're sitting there and Jesus, is, Jesus comes in, he sits down and he starts to share this new world order, this, this new way of living. He's ushering in th this new life, these new ideas, this new belief, and he's interrupted. Can you imagine the audacity? Can you imagine just coming in and interrupting Jesus? He's interrupted by a group of men and one woman. And the woman, you know, is not fully clothed. She could be wrapped in a bed sheet or a blanket. We don't know. But they've caught her literally in the act of having sex with a man who wasn't her, her husband. And the Torah says, that's a sin. And this particular sin, the Torah says, is punishable by death. And not only that specifically, it's the pulverization of rocks to the skull to swell the skull and the brain in such a way that the human human goes into a coma and eventually dies. It's gory. It's gruesome. It's graphic. And, and these men, listen to this, these men come into church ready to crush the skull of a woman because of her sin. If that's not the rebuilder of our human condition and, and human nature, church, I don't know what is. But what will Jesus say? These men are very focused on sin. They've categorized one sin worse than the others. And you may say, what about their sin? Great point. Clearly, they decided that their sin is not as bad as her sin. Her sin is a physical, her, a physical sin, a sex act. And it, Matthew 5, the, the great sermon on the mountaintop, Jesus is saying, the law says, if you sleep with someone you're married to, that is a sin. But I say, I say, Jesus says, if you look at someone and lust in your heart, that's the same thing as committing adultery. And the crowd would have been stunned. Jesus on sin. He's intensifying the standard. What will Jesus say now to this woman whose head is, is no doubt hanging in shame and humiliation? And it's all intended by these religious leaders and men who are passionate about rules and regulations and traditions. They have come with every intention of killing this woman. And they, the, the Bible says as we read it that they already have rocks in their hands. What will he say? Is this not a sin? Are they, are they wrong in, in the reading of the Torah? They are not. In fact, it was a sin. So what will Jesus say? At first he says nothing. And, and I love it because it demonstrates the way that we need to look like him. Jesus isn't quick to speak or to cast judgment, or even to throw rocks. He did not answer them. 
he bent down and he started to write in the dust with his fingers. Now he could have been fulfilling Jeremiah 17. Or he could have been insinuating the last time the finger of God was on earth was when the finger of God was forging the Ten Commandments. Or it could have been about Genesis, the finger of God that was shaping and making man and woman. Maybe that's what it is. But let's continue with the story to see if, if we can discover Jesus' take on sin. Is Jesus light on sin? Does Jesus overlook sin? Does Jesus give like the wink in the, in the finger, the gun to sin? What, what is the focus of Jesus on sin? But uh, these men become angry. These men are right in the reading of the scripture, but they are so wrong. It, it's incredible, isn't it? You can be so right that you can be so wrong. And they're angry and they're judgmental and, and they're creating their own system of categorizing which sins are worse than others. And I might add that today we still suffer from these same religious practices. Are, are you like me? Uh, I feel because the ramifications, the implications, or the outcome of a certain sin or, or certain act of sin is worse than others, that maybe that sin is worse. And if someone's sin is worse than yours, what happens? You feel better about yourself. Or you think that you're better than them. And this affects how we live. It affects how we live life probably more than we realize. You, you may be watching right now and say, hey, pastor, preacher, man, that I, I just found on Facebook. I don't believe in sin. But if we're honest and we look at the landscape of the world, we look at the hurt, we look at the pain, we look at the loss, the offense, the, the wars and rumors of war, all of these things we inherently and innately know that there is such thing as a right and there is such thing as a wrong. There is such thing as sin. We know that, but what will we do with that? I want, you to, I want to tell you there's a savior who wants to save you from your sin, your error, your wrong. <clears throat> but what will Jesus say on sin? What's his take on sin? And angry, they keep persisting. And they keep insisting. And he says to them, they, let's have the man who has never had a sinful desire throw the first stone at her. Let the man without a sinful desire say it. Throw the first stone at her and then he went back to doodling in the dust do you do you see it church do you see Jesus's take on sin the focus of Jesus when it comes to sin the, these men come to church prepared to point out who has sin who has sin and then at the end Jesus says go and and from now on be free from a life of sin their idea of being free from a life of sin is focusing on sin and calling out people who have sin because that's the way that they approach or to deal with sin. My wife and I, when we went to Texas, we went to Seattle for one night and as we were going through the, the over, uh, under the overpasses, we saw two banners and one after the other, big bold letters that said, Jesus or hell. And I thought to myself, as, as I'm reading this, I, I'm sure that person meant well when they put that up. But I am here to tell you that that is not Jesus' approach to sin. If it is, show it to me. Show me in this where that is Jesus' approach to sin. Jesus doesn't have the same approach as the religious leaders who want to free you and me from sin by focusing on sin, by calling out the sin in our life, by obsessing over sin, by killing people with sin, or categorizing different sins in people, or devaluing people because of the sin in their life. And there, right there, you have the definition in simple language of religion. Religion is the obsession of sin, traditions, categories, elitism, exclusivity, and hierarchy. It, it's using the laws of, of, and teachings of Jesus to make ourselves feel better. <clears throat> to make ourselves feel better than others. What does Jesus say on sin? Do you guys see it? Do you see it from the readings? 
It says, let's have the man who has never had a sinful desire throw the first stone at her. I, I personally believe, this is my personal opinion, do not believe it's not, it's, it's not just the statement that provokes these men to drop their, their rocks and leave the scene and not kill this woman because of her sin. Even though they were right according to the law, they were not in the right spirit, the heart, and the approach of Jesus. I think when they saw these words, when, it said, when Jesus says, let's have the man who has never had a sinful desire throw the first stone at her. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't believe that it's just the words of Jesus. I believe that when they heard these words, I believe the Spirit of God cut them to their hearts. And the oldest to the youngest dropped their rocks and walked away. I hope you see this. I hope you see Jesus' take on sin. This is a complete opposite approach for sin than those religious leaders, church leaders, preachers, sermons. Do you see it? They say we found someone with sin, and it's one of the top sins, one of the bad sins. Jesus, what are you going to say about this? He says nothing, and they begin to push him. And they say, Jesus, give us a verdict. We want to take her life because her sin is worse than our sin. It, that sin doesn't belong in church. It, does, does that sound at all familiar? It does for me because I've been there. It's, it's amazing in these times that so many of us have gone screaming in the other direction, even at the notion that we very, mel, very may well have lust in our hearts, that we may have racism in our hearts, that we may have lying in our hearts or gossip in our hearts. Why are we so repulsed by some, some sins and not by others? The notion that we might be a culprit in these sins, where you say, I would never do that. Look at what they're doing. I would never do that. A reason why we are repulsed at the idea that we may have these sins in our hearts because the those are one of the big ones, church. That's one of the big ones. I'm not that bad. Now, you know, I may manipulate a little bit. Pastor, I may exaggerate a bit. I may maybe have a little too much to eat, or I may drink a little much. I'm a little greedy sometimes, ah, but come on. Racism, lying, gossip, cheating, never. I would never do that. But it it's brought up our human plight. And I don't blame anyone for that. It's our human plight. We have, in fact, ranked some sins that are just too high in the ranking to own it. And so we resist it and we fight it. And we want to say and give reasons why we don't struggle with it. Part of that is, is we believe that that is a proper approach to sin. Do you see it? Do you see this? I'm going to read it one last time, and I want you to see this. He says, let's have the man who has never had a sinful desire throw the first stone at her. And then he bent over again and wrote some more, more words in the dust. And that's all he says. Here it is. Here's Jesus' take on sin. The religious leaders are focused on who has sin. Jesus' focus is on who doesn't have sin. You want to know Jesus with sin? I'm going to read it again. The religious leaders are focused on who has sin. Jesus is focused on who doesn't have sin. Hey, preachers, we get it. I'm going to pick on my own kind here. We are all busy focused on who has sin. I want to suggest that we, we need to elevate our perspective. We have to approach the same sin the same way Jesus does. What's Jesus' primary focus? I'm not saying that he overlooks or ignores sin. I, absolutely not. I do not want you to get me wrong on this. He does not overlook sin or ignore it. It is so serious, in fact, that he gave himself to become sin. But notice the focus of, of Jesus in this. He, his focus on who doesn't have sin. And suddenly that becomes a small group, doesn't it? Well, it, it doesn't even become a group at all. It's just one. It's one individual. And he's the one speaking. And he's saying, let's do this, guys. Whoever doesn't have sin, throw the first stone. 
Now, now this we know. These men have sin. And I would like to suggest again that we know that we have sin. We know that we have error and wrong and selfishness. We think about ourselves way too much and we hurt others around us. You know, in the 20 years of marriage, I have had to ask forgiveness from Crystal a lot of times. And maybe a lot of times in this week of being home together without being able to leave. I know that I have sinned. Jesus is saying, whoever has, th this, this sunk deep into my soul this week. They missed the part where they should have asked, who doesn't have sin? They drop their rocks and they walk away. Isn't that question begging to be asked in our story today? Who doesn't have sin? That's the question. That's the focus. Church, his name is Jesus. He has no sin. In these stories where we watch, we watch Jesus and these, all these verses that we read throughout the entire Bible, I'm going to let you in on something. It's always about Jesus. It, it wasn't about these men. They're essentially saying all of us have sin. They're revealing that you have sin, that they have sin, and you want to kill this woman who has sin, but we all have sin. And Jesus is saying, if you're going to throw rocks, the only person who, sh who should be able to throw rocks is someone who doesn't have sin. In fact, they haven't even had sinful thoughts or desires. Tempted to sin, but no desires within themselves. Who could that be? That is Jesus. Church, we have to level the playing field. We are living in such a dynamic world right now. The, the information age, right? So as a result, we have so much data about sin, so much information about sin, about error, about pain, about war, about manipulation. We have all these details, and it's so easy to point up across continents or countries or states or neighborhoods. And all the while, we have missed ourselves. We have missed the mark. We have all sinned and fallen short of, of God's glorious standard. You know, I've read so many times, hey, no matter what happens with this election, can we just all speak well of each other and not tear each other down? And I've read posts where the author of that post then goes on to say in the comments, everything bad about the candidate that, that he or she does not like. So I, I called a good friend of mine in California. And I said, you had this post. And then underneath it, you're continuing to, to tear down President Trump. That doesn't line up with what you were saying. And their response is, he won't, he won't ever see it. Like I, I can shout at him, but I'm, I'm talking about just my friends. But, but I saw it. Others saw it. <clears throat> Others have heard those same things. Do you, do you know where this cancel culture comes from? And if you don't know cancel culture, I want you to look it up. Cancel culture is where a group of people go and they shame someone for something they've said or done. And they essentially cancel them. It could be a celebrity, it could be a news anchor, whatever it is, they cancel them. Do you know where this cancel culture comes from? The categorizing and ranking of sin. See, I can lie to my wife, but if you're running for political office and you say a lie, well, that's worse. And you should be canceled. And I think the, the hypocr hypocrisy of 2020. What does Jesus say about our selfishness, our error, our wrong? Here's how Jesus handles the cancel culture. He said, it's fine. Whoever is without sin, you cancel people. But do you know what this entire story is about? This entire story is telling you and me something so powerful, something so potent and important. Please hear me, church. It's, this story is telling us that the only man... Fully God and fully man, Jesus, who has no sin or no sinful desires. He literally is the only person on this planet that can cancel somebody or throw rocks at somebody. And he, I'm here to tell you the good news. He won't. He won't do this. And he doesn't. The, the Bible says that they dropped their rocks and walked away. Now this woman is standing there, head probably still hanging low. Jesus bent over, riding in the dirt. 
and suddenly the camera zooms in, if you will, and it, and it gets quiet. And Jesus stands up and he's doing the only thing that Jesus can do, which is clear the room. And this act of love was, was tantamount to the relationship and intimacy he has with us, church. He clears the room for the broken, humiliated woman, and yet the accusation was, was accurate. She had sin. She did do wrong. They were right. And Jesus says, go, and from now on, be free from a life of sin. It's alluding to the fact that she's probably, I, I look at this and I'm thinking, okay, he says, look. And, and I picture me being in that room, and she's probably head hang low, tears in her eyes. She wipes away the tears so she can see the room is empty. She looks around and sees that the men who are carrying out her sentence for her death, they're gone. Please hear me. Only Jesus can do this. Only Jesus can do this for you. Only he can forgive your error, your wrong, your sin. He's the only one that can clear the room of, you, of your soul that's full of condemning voices telling you you are what you've done. You're not going to change. I see what you've done. And, and COVID puts you in a place away from people and, and all you are with are your thoughts. And your thoughts are telling you, see, this is who you really are. And then preachers like me come and we focus on sin and we give sermons on sin. And it, it only compounds the problem and the self-focus and we fester with shame and guilt on the inside. But only Jesus can do this. Only, only Jesus can do this. And it says that they dropped their rocks and they left the oldest to the youngest. I want you to know that Jesus wants to do this in your life. He wants to get, a, get rid of the sin that you remember, the oldest sin in your life to the newest sin in your life that maybe you, you, you did this morning or last night, whatever it is, the oldest to the youngest, Jesus forgives. The woman looks up and everyone is gone. And Jesus says, well, I, I know you see no one. I don't condemn you either. Go. And from now on, be free of a life of sin. Do you know what produces freedom from lust? Produces freedom from greed, from lying, from racism, Freedom from this cancel culture, freedom from condemnation, freedom from self-centeredness and striving. The power to overcome sin is not focusing on sin, church, hear me. The power of, to overcoming sin is not focusing on sin. Let's shift our focus. It's focusing on who has no sin. It's not focusing on the sin or those with sin. It's focusing on the one who has no sin. The religious leaders they come and they're focused on who has sin. Jesus is focused on who has no sin. It's about him. Church, that's where the power is. You want to gain power over and freedom from sin. Focus on the one who has no sin. That is, this is the victory that has overcome the world. We can overcome by Jesus with the power, the deliverer, and savior of the world. His name is Jesus, church. Do you want to overcome sin? Stop focusing on sin. Your focus is still on that sin. Start focusing on the one who has no sin. Jesus is, is our hope. He's the way. Why? Because he's the only one without sin. So, we, so he became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. Do you know what that means? We become right in our standing with God, in our relationship with a God that is holy and is perfect. Jesus does that. So yes, Waitsburg Christian Church, what an opportunity we have in the midst of this madness going on around us to see progress, to see diversity, to see equity, to see dignity. But I want you to know it, it won't simply happen by the efforts, the systems, the traditions, the religion and approaches of men and women who seek to focus on those who have sin. Stop looking at others who have sin and ranking the sin that they have just so you feel better about yourself. We all have sin. Can we turn our focus, church, to the one who has no sin? I chose to focus on the person who has no sin. For only he has the power to forgive my sin in my life and set my life in a new motion. Sin no longer plays a role in my relationship with Jesus. I am free. Your life is no longer defined by the sin that you have. Your life is defined by the one who has no sin. He is your savior. 
And if he's not your savior, he can be yours today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you. I feel your presence. I feel your presence strongly here. And I know your presence is strong in the, in the lives of those watching right now. Father, we thank you that instead of the focus on sin, which you don't look, look the other way from sin, you thought it so important that you gave your life for it so that we could be free. Father, I, I pray that we stop focusing on our sin to try to overcome it, to try to beat it. When we can focus on the one who has no sin, that gives us true freedom from the sin in our life that we're struggling with. Freedom from a lifestyle of preparing and planning to sin. We are going to sin, Jesus. But you have set us free from a lifestyle that that's doomed to simply just keep sinning, hurting ourselves and others. I pray for that freedom now. Father, if someone's watching right now that has not yet accepted this freedom, that today is the day that they turn their focus from their sin to you. That they believe in their hearts and speak with your lips that you are king, you are without sin, you are everything. And we follow you. They turn from their life and start following you, Lord. You know who needs this right now, Lord. And I pray that you just pierce their hearts so deeply that today they realize I can focus on you instead of my sin, my error, my wrong, my shortcomings, my obsessions, Lord. I can focus on you. We love you, Lord. Thank you. We love you so, so much. I love you deeply, Lord. I love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. Church, we love you. Um, we'll see you next week. But I, I pray that this week you get this in your head that instead of focusing on where you've fallen short or where others have fallen short, because I know those people who have fallen short, they know they've fallen short, and they don't need us kicking them when they're down. But that we turn our focus on the one who has no sin that can guide us out of it. God bless you, church. I hope you have a blessed week. Stay safe, and we'll see you next week.